So we are joined this evening, as you know, um, by two incredible women. And I just, when I was thinking through um, how to arrange feedback, and I knew this would be a precarious evening uh, to, to be presenting, to be facilitating the group. And um, so I wanted to work with two people that I know and that I trust. And um, they are Dr. Tanya Shields and Shara Nova. And they're both just such incredible people. And I think that they're, you know, they're incredible thinkers. They are both artists. And um, I'll just tell you quickly about who they are. And then I'll turn it over for them to them to facilitate. Um, and so Dr. Shields uh, is in the Women's and Gender Studies Department at UNC. Uh, she also is the director of Carolina Seminars, which is this wonderful opportunity for folks all across campus to come together and just explore their passions as a group. Um, she's also a dramaturg, so uh, she works with a theater company to help uh, guide, you know, facilitate conversations around theater, theater history, and the contemporary moment. Um, and she's, you know, working with Shara um, through her Creative Futures Mellon funded grant uh, that we're just so pleased that, you know, Shara is able to join us at Carolina Performing Arts for that. Um, Shara Manova is joining us from, from Mass MoCA where she's, she's working right now, um, which is amazing that, you know, Mass MoCA is able to support our artists during this period of time, just thinking about arts economies and different ways of working. Um, and so, uh, so we're so pleased to, to kind of see her from this other arts institution. Um, up north. And Shara also goes by My Brightest Diamond, and I've had the pleasure to see her perform as My Brightest Diamond at the Hall River Ballroom right next door to my house. And it was just an awesome show. The lights went out in the midst of the show, and she just kept going. So I thought, well, if Shara can keep going when the power goes out, then she can definitely host feedback during election week. <laughs> Um, she's also from Detroit, so, you know, she has a very unique perspective on arts economies when it comes to, to making art in Detroit. She's not in New York, and I thought she would, you know, bring an interesting perspective for that reason as well. Um, so, uh, without further ado, here is our dynamic duo of um, Sharanova and Tanya Shields. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Amanda. And Shara, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself first, since I'm going to lead the first exercise, and so I'll go after you. I'm Shara Nova. My pronouns are she, her, and I am right now on Wabanaki Confederacy land and Nipmuc, and also um, I believe the um, The Mohican people also are here. And as a child of white settlers from England, I feel that that is also part of what I need to do in describing myself, is coming to acknowledge the people who were on this land before me and that um, as I identify myself being a person with chosen red hair and in an empty, large room here in um, Mass Mocha. And the song that you heard today was a piece that I wrote called Try, Tratar de Transformar. And it was um, composed for a choir in Cincinnati, and I'll tell you more about that later. And But it was sung in this recording by a choir in Berlin during quarantine. And everyone recorded themselves on their phones, on their computers. And then it was um, featuring Gabby Moreno, who is Guatemalan. And we created that track. Um, all of the proceeds go to KIND which is a organization which is supporting the children who have been separated from their families at our borders. So 
Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. I'm happy to see your faces. Good evening. My name is Tanya Shields. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a nut brown black woman uh, with my hair in pigtails at 50. But, you know, that's life in quarantine. <laughs> what happens? Uh, I wear glasses, I'm gonna have them on shortly. And my background is a cluttered office, much like my life. So um, I'm sure I'm reflecting many of your realities. This is just a really short PowerPoint. And in fact, we're not going to get through all of it. And what I'll, I'll try to do is, I'm actually going to talk through the PowerPoint, but stop it at points so we can have conversation together. Uh, one of the things that became really clear when Shara and I were talking about this, you know, the idea of arts and economy or arts economies, where the idea of placemaking was overwhelming. The idea of arts ecologies were overwhelming. And so we want to, to think through that with you. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So yeah, so we want to think about placemaking, our spatial relationships, how those spatial relationships inform other types of relationships that we have with people, with other beings, with nature. And here are some definitions, and I'm not going to read through all of them. I'm going to let you read them for yourselves. But I want us to think about this idea of space as a place where everything uh, takes place, but then place being even more specific. So if we're making place, we're making a more specific place. And I am going to, there are four questions that I want us to consider. And I'm also going to pose, the, put those questions in the chat, because I'll, I'll ask to stop the screen shortly, so that we can have a chat about these four. So the four questions are, which spaces are valued in your community? And I guess we can also talk about what is your community? How do you define community? In which spaces in that place you call a community do you belong? Are there spaces you avoid? If so, which ones? And why do you avoid those places? And what would you like your community space to look like if it currently is not a place you feel welcomed? Okay, so if we can pause and go back to full screen. So the questions are also in the chat. So the first one, which spaces would you say are valued in your community? I think art spaces are. Terrific. And when you say art spaces, are you thinking about that in a particular kind of way or broadly defined? Um, broadly, but also specifically, Jerry Lynn will, I was at the art center today and I and a lot of other people value that space. Taking an art class with six people in two rooms so that we were spaced out. What are some other spaces that are valued in your community? Jim? Well, today, outdoor space. Right. And are there particular types of outdoor space that, are, that you would say are valued more than others? Uh, well, we uh, went to the um, uh, North Carolina Museum of Art and walked around the out, out, outside exhibits right. as an example. Okay. Wonderful. Others? And if you can either take off your mic or wave at me, I'll know, I'll know to call on you then. Yeah. Yeah. I want to chime in here. There are some spaces that really changed my life. And one was the coffee shop um, because it allowed me to um, learn how to be a better performer and to learn how to write songs and to have a low pressure environment to develop. Um, another really 
challenging thing, which is why I'm in this place here, is having small venues to develop work. And um, that is one thing in Detroit that we don't really have is small black box theaters. And so you don't see the development of um, theater coming from Detroit because we simply don't have that kind of infrastructure. And um, great sound systems in any venue are really always important for a musician. Um, but for sure, small venues have been really pivotal in my life. Yeah, and one of the things that I like that you say there that isn't on this list, but I, I would be happy to add it and ask you all to think about it, is transformational space. You know, when you talked about that, that coffee shop was a space that transformed you from an amateur to a professional. You know, are there spaces like that that we have in our community that are transformational? So I, I heard that the, the art center is sort of a transformational space because you're creating art there. I'm even hearing that this museum where you get to walk around and see, you know, beautiful objects is another type of space. And Sri writes, uh, uh, in the chat. I saw the definition of space mainly in a physical context. Could we also consider the spaces that we navigate based on identities? Or spaces that have value provide joy not because of their physical features, but because of how the policies and people are inclusive and accessible? Yes. No, absolutely. This conversation is not already being had, and I think that's a wonderful uh, addition. So are there other responses? Millie? I was gonna, I, just paying attention to your slide, I couldn't help but think about the campus and what type of space a college or university campus is within a community. It's almost always valued, but it can be transformational or you know, not transformational <laughs> enough, depending on the people, the policies and how integrated it is with its surrounding community. Other thoughts, other ideas? So one thought that came to my mind was places of worship. Um, and then also, I think to Shree's point, how so many of the spaces that we have been thinking about have transitioned into these virtual, these online spaces where once upon a time we might have been in this group in a physical space together. And now here we are all from our own homes or personal spaces together in this space. Right. And there's a way that this space, and I, I have to confess, I have never been a proponent of like online classes because I feel, you know, I get an energy from being with people in the classroom, but there's also an opportunity here to dialogue with people who may not be in the same physical space, same geography that I find, you know, interesting and exciting. But what about, how would you characterize the spaces you belong to? What makes you belong to the space, would you say? Representation, that you feel seen or that there are other people in the space that you identify with and people that know your name. That helps. <laughs> yeah. Jonathan? Well, I was actually going to answer the previous question, but I guess it's sort of the same thing because what I was thinking about community space, my mind goes to Weaver Street Market in Carborough and the outdoor space there, which is kind of very much a, the definition of a community space and how hard it is right now to not have that. Um, but if I think about uh, what makes me feel welcome and I think about there, I think about um, arriving here after HB2 and seeing the stickers that have been placed around um, uh, rainbow stickers, which made it clear that each many establishments around Chapel and Carbo were LGBT friendly. So it's a small thing, but it's very helpful to feel safe and secure to know that uh, explicitly you've been welcomed. Great, thank you. And you were taking your mic off earlier, yeah. I think uh, shared interest, at least for me, that's what makes me feel most comfortable when I'm in any kind of 
event or meeting or anything with other people who I know are um, on my same page when it comes to prioritization of the arts or enjoyment of the arts. That, that's what makes me feel like I'm among my people. Great. Anyone else? Yeah, sure. um, I'm a theater maker. So anytime I'm in a rehearsal room or in a performance space with other people, I feel like I belong. In fact, I enjoy the rehearsal process so much that when the audience starts to become involved, I kind of resent it. <laughs> because I'm like, these are my people. Like this, this group of theater makers, that's my people. And you guys are intrusive on the people. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, a, a similar space for me are libraries because libraries are a space that you can encounter all different kinds of people everyone is welcome nobody judges you for what you might know or not know about how to move in the space and um, that's another kind of space that I like a lot Jim? I, I was going to say that uh, something that makes me feel like I fit is, is a sense of ownership. Uh, but, it, but I think I'm, I want to change that to a, a sense of responsibility. And it seems like, you know, if I'm in a group and somebody's not participating, I feel a sense of responsibility to make sure that everybody participates or, you know, that we have a bigger crowd than we would have had or that we have a more involved group. Um, so I think that to the degree that a space can bring that sense of involvement, I think that helps to get engagement. Right. I like that word responsibility. And I, I have to confess, I've been thinking about that uh, a lot. Like what, how are we responsible or accountable to the strangers we walk the street with? You know, so our neighbors whose names we may not know. So yeah, so that, that word really resonates with me. I found this book really fantastic, the Creative Community Builders Handbook. And what I found really wonderful about it is, again, it talks about not only placemaking, but the idea of an ecology, of an arts ecology, and what does, what does that look like? And one of the things for me that came out of thinking again about art and economies or art ecologies of like building a system of sort of nested, uh, that's nested in, in each other is this idea of a network that's interacting with each other. So what parts of the network are we gonna bring together to create an ecology that is not only art space, but helps us build strong communities. And part of what I'm, I'm thinking of in terms of these nested systems are things like transportation, housing, um, other types of infrastructure, technology, health, food. You know, uh, Shara talked about youth and having a place where youth are nurtured. You know, that, that coffee house is both a place of business, but it was also a place of art in a community. So how can we have uh, spaces that work together? I'm sorry, there's a, I'm not sure, was someone trying to say something? Yeah, so those are some things that I want us to think about in terms of ecology, like these nested systems that are interactive and how can we have, I think, you know, we might think of art as in the museum or at the art center, but how can we have art in the park? How can we have art in, um, in the school that's maybe in the part of town that people try to avoid that, or how can we have art at the farmer's market? Someone, yeah, Jonathan talked about Weaver Street. You know, so how can we, how can we uh, try and think about ways that art works with these other parts of building community? In terms of creative economies, this is a term that emerged in the 1990s where people started looking very specifically at how creativity and creative work can be part of economic development. And you know, you read some pieces where you got the numbers from the, the NEA, I think, about the you know, multi-billion dollar industry that arts bring to various communities, including communities right here in North Carolina. And uh, one of the uh, economists, 
and Marcusen talks about the artistic dividend, that the productivity and earnings in regional economies rise in correlation to the number of artists. So actually, the more artists we have, the, the more um, economic wealth we can generate. And Amanda was sharing that in your previous discussion uh, last, last time, whenever that was, that you talked about people in in Orange County spend more on arts related things than they do on sports related things. And I think in this climate where I believe a third of museums are in danger of closing forever because of the pandemic, that we really have an opportunity as we you know, start to think about what life is going to be after COVID or when we get to manage COVID, how do we rebuild those capacities? How do we rebuild those spaces of um, art creation? And one of the things, a couple of things I wanted to point you to, first you read Monica Burns um, piece and she, she talks about you know, being a writer who's trying to look for different models to support herself. And so she's this Patreon page. But there are links here, and actually I promise that I will put these in the, um, in the chat so that you, you can have these links and follow them for yourself. I'll find them and, and put them. And, and we can also share this PowerPoint too, that might make it easier. But the first two links are about a project in Asheville, North Carolina. And basically it was this small town of less than 3000 people where because of highway development, people had left the town. The only people who sort of remained were the people who had no place to go. There, there wasn't a lot of opportunity in this town. And you can, yeah, uh -huh, it's still here. Yeah, but they did have an artist community. And what happened is in that community, they did an assessment and they worked with government. They worked with a housing organization to build low income housing and to center the arts of that community. And it, they, in doing so, they not only sort of rebuilt the town, kept it affordable, even as housing prices in Asheville were going up because it became such a, a destination for retirees, but they, they were able to keep the people uh, who had historically lived in that community in that community, but they also built up natural spaces. So there was a way in which the affordable housing, um, the elements, and in, in the houses that they built, the artists also would um, make things for those houses to make them unique. So this experiment is one of the many that um, Barup talks about, but this one is from our very own state. And so you can see how these synergies are happening in, in our particular state by just following those links. And can you go to the next slide, please? So the other uh, thing I, I I think is really important about this whole project of placemaking and looking at ecosystems is it's part of an equitable development model. And that means that people are looking at both racial and looking at this development through a racial and equity lens. That it's not just about, you know, pulling in businesses that might push people out, but how can we keep the people who have been historically there, even as we attract newcomers to a space. So it's about equitable development, and it's also about a community-centered arts culture, which has a social justice lens. And so that social justice lens is, again, about this idea of transformation. How do we transform our societies, make them more inclusive, make them more responsive to the people who live there, and help those people, all the things you said earlier, be seen, be heard, uh, feel like they belong, and engage. So those are, are part of, of building these healthy, connected societies. As a person who moved to Detroit from New York, um, I had a relationship to Michigan. Um, I lived there as a teenager, but I became very aware when I moved to Detroit that I was, frankly, an agent of gentrification, whether I wanted to be one or not. That my very act of moving there to a black city was a kind of invasion. And I had never... Um, experienced that awareness and um, 
the question that became very pressing to me was what is my relationship to where I am? That I can't, um, and I began to see a lot of white folks moving in town and um, using the language of blank canvas, uh, wild west, um, a kind of erasure a language of erasure and disrespect of who was there for hundreds of years. And so that, that became uh, something that I, I ha have to think about um, and continue to have to think about. How is it that I, as an international artist, also begin to create a local economy when the local economy has a very hard time supporting um, professional musicians because folks aren't getting paid? And with, um, of course, with uh, streaming services, um, uh, I'm reading this in the chat, blank canvas, is terra nullius, colonial language for the blank slate. Yes, and that continued, continues a little less so in the last few years, but um, it, it really was the case in Detroit. Uh, I mean, I've lived there now for 11 years, but um, it, I really, really observed that. Um, so, Let's go to my screen share. I've got some pictures for you. So, um, as a professional musician, as a white woman, um, I have observed the success of many, many, many of my white contemporary males. And part of the um, just it is just simply fact, which is why I wanted to send you that article on women in the music industry. But beyond that article, the people who um, booking agents, label managers, album distribution, um, promote venue promoters, um, journalists. If I were to evaluate those, like that level of um, the industry, then the percentages would be even, even smaller. You, you might think because you see women in pop that because they are the face or the microphone, you might think that the percentages are different, but they actually are, are really dramatic percentages. And so for me, um, I had to decide how do I want to deal with that? I think for many years of my life, I was chasing the pyramid. I wanted to be at the top of the pyramid with the boys. And I wrote the most ambitious music that I could. I had to prove that I was smart. I had to prove that I could write orchestral music, that I could write, be on a big scale, blah, blah, blah. And, um, at a certain point, that crashed. I became less interested in proving my genius, the sole genius of the individual, and more interested in relationship. And what could I do with the, with the privilege and with the power and with the access that I have to begin to support other people and to, to be to have a sense of belonging that I wanted to also be a part of. Um, and so that's where I am now, is searching for ideas and ways of building an economy for myself as well that are about belonging and about relationship in community because I need a sense of belonging as well. Um, and looking at leadership, um, and this idea of the sole genius or the head CEO. It's like, well, um, some of this is taken from, from Adrian Marie Brown, who studies um, emergent, or who wrote the book Emergent Strategies, but about the way that, that flocks of birds shift leadership and how might I be able to shift 
um, shift the way that I work in this industry um, and look for the models of mutual aid, the models of sharing um, experience. So taking these kind of uh, conceptual micro uh, to the macro, what does it look like? Um, it looks some, well, I'll stay on this one for a second. Um, it looks like when I get opportunity, um, maybe I refer it to someone else instead of taking the gig myself. And instead of just turning something down, I actually curate who I have as a recommendation, which means that I need to be fostering those relationships. And um, it also means that I often will, um, I will look for grants and help people write grants because learning how to write grant language um, takes time and it's taken people helping me learn how to do it. So I try to give that just very informally, but I try to give that to other people. Um, I want to also give you an example of a, a group of people that have been really uh, inspirational to me, and that's Bang on a Can. And Bang on a Can is three composers who decided to create something themselves. And they made an ensemble called the Bang on a Can All-Stars, and those um, folks play their music. And so then they had an, an immediate outlet for their uh, compositions to be made. And then they made a, a weekend that not only was their compositions, but could house other people's compositions. And so that became a bang on a can marathon, which started out as a 12 hour or something like that, uh, uh, marathon of music and then it turned into a weekend but by creating this umbrella for other other composers then a scene got developed um, and minimalism or this kind of new contemporary music which doesn't really have a place in um, <laughs> the, the commercial marketplace suddenly developed a scene um, and there are many examples of, of this, but this is just one. So this idea of creating an umbrella experiences or umbrella organizations that can foster other people's work, not just my own, became really, really interesting to me. Um, the Roots, the band The Roots also um, was very deliberate about how they created um, neo soul or a scene for neo soul, and by creating festivals, they they began to to put in the public consciousness that oh yeah these artists are um, there is a there is a connectedness between this group of people, and uh, so they've been another model for me for sure. Um, the Cincinnati Symphony approached me and asked me to, to um, do something, uh, this was in 2019, um, and so I will just quickly, I want to get to us being able to talk and ask questions, but um, I basically um, worked with the symphony and asked the question, who's here and how can I build um, a framework where we can hear each other and what might that look like um, in a music event. So I worked with um, about 10 different community choirs and created pairings and created conversation, not just where everyone presented themselves or presented their own work, but that there was always some intersection of the choirs engaging with one another in some kind of conversation. Um, and I asked 
people questions. What are you what are you mad about? What are you sad about? What's happened here that's the thing that we're that we have a difficult time talking about? And then I composed songs um, in collaboration with those choirs um, to facilitate um, a public performance where we might be able to sit with some of those questions together. Um, we worked with dance groups and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, local ensembles. And one of the rules was that uh, I tried to have as little amplification as possible, except for the rappers, because rap, you need a microphone for that. So um, I worked largely with choirs and marching bands, um, and also, and also, um, the rapper Siri Imani had an amazing poem, which the title for the whole piece called Look Around, and really centering this poem of hers, which I set um, to orchestra. So let's go back uh, to what is within your reach. What can we do now from humming to building partnerships with our two other friends and dreaming together. And I think that's the example I want to show I wanted to show you was when when two or three are gathered together, if I may uh, invoke uh, being a pastor's daughter, um, but if if we gather together in small numbers, what might we begin to dream about? Um, and from, from collective dreaming, we can come up with some really, really amazing new um, ways of making art in community. And that's super exciting to me. And I think there's an openness to um, trying new things that, that before maybe we were a little stuck in this is the way we do things. But I'm also one um, that... I am not waiting for anyone to hand me my dream. No one knows my dream. Only I can make it because it's particular to my skill set and to my place in the world. And so only you have the longing that you have in yourself and and you are the only like you are the dreamer through whom that longing can manifest. And so be encouraged. Be encouraged with the uniqueness of what you are bringing to the table. And then um, I want to leave time for us to collectively dream a little bit together. <laughs>